Good afternoon, ladies and uh, gentlemen. Thanks for joining us uh, this afternoon. Uh, this will be the first of our three Charles E. Test MD distinguished uh, lectures given by Professor uh, Stephen uh, Smith. Uh, Charles E. Uh, Test, a distinguished alumnus of uh, this university, was the original benefactor uh, to the James Madison program. Uh, a gift that he uh, sent in uh, was used to establish this lecture series, which has been uh, uh, host uh, for some of uh, our nation's and the world's most distinguished scholars. Uh, and they are joined very worthily this evening by, uh, this afternoon by Professor Stephen Smith. Professor Smith is the Warren Distinguished Professor of Law and co-director of the Institute for Law and Religion at the University of San Diego. He was previously the Robert and Marion Short Professor of Law at the University of Notre Dame Law School and the Byron R. White uh, Professor of Law at the University of Colorado. He is the author of several important books, most recently, The Rise and Decline of American Religious Freedom, which was published in 2014 by Harvard University Press, and The Disenchantment of Secular Discourse, published by Harvard in 2010. He's also the author of Getting Over Equality, subtitled A Critical Diagnosis of Religious Freedom in America, published by New York University Press in 2001, and Foreordained Failure, subtitled The Quest for a Constitutional Principle of Religious Freedom, uh, published by Oxford University Press in 1995. Uh, he's uh, the author of many uh, important and valuable uh, articles. Uh, one of his, uh, uh, one of my uh, favorites of, of his uh, happened to be a critical review of one of my books published under the wonderful title, you might recall, Stephen, uh, Natural Law, A Guide from the Perplexed. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Professor Smith will be lecturing uh, three times this week, uh, this afternoon, tomorrow afternoon, uh, and Thursday afternoon, all of the lectures are at 4.30, and they are here in Lewis Library 120. This evening's lecture is entitled The Pagan City, the Christian City, and the Secular City. Tomorrow's lecture is Culture Wars as Pagan Counter-Revolution. And Thursday's lecture is Coming Home, the Imminent, Imminent City. Uh, I left uh, one uh, uh, set of facts out about uh, Professor uh, Smith, uh, and that his, uh, his education. Uh, he was uh, an undergrad, his undergraduate degree is entirely respectable, Bachelor of, Bachelor of Arts from Brigham Young University, uh, but then alas, he earned his law degree at Yale. <laughs> Professor Smith. Yeah. Th thanks a lot, Robbie, and uh, it really is a pleasure to be here. Um, for years, I have admired the Madison program, the work that it does, the people I've known who have worked with it or been associated with it. And so it's a tremendous honor to be here. I think probably an undeserved honor, but I, but I uh, appreciate the invitation to participate. I have to say, I mentioned this morning, what I really would have liked is to have been here just a week ago today and heard the bluegrass, you know, the, the Madison program, bluegrass program. And I hope one day to be able to enjoy that as well. But um, for tonight, I'm going to be talking about pagans and Christians in the city. And I've taken this somewhat improbable sounding theme uh, for these lectures from three sets of lectures, uh, three lectures that were given at Cambridge University in 1939 by the poet T.S. Eliot. Eliot argued that the future of Western societies would be determined by a contest between Christianity and a rival that he described as modern paganism. I believe, he said, that the choice before us is between the formation of a new Christian culture and the acceptance of a pagan one. The problem with this thesis, it may seem, is that it comes too late, by about 2,000 years. Eliot's diagnosis might have been apt for the Roman world of late antiquity. At that time, paganism and Christianity did constitute the principal alternatives, or at least so we may suppose with the benefit of hindsight. Christianity is thought to have prevailed in that struggle, so that from the late Roman Empire through the early modern period, Western peoples lived under what we often describe as Christendom. But history's moved on. Today, the live alternative to the Christian ordering, or the successor to it, is not a pagan society, it would seem, but rather a secular one. This historical paradigm in which the West has moved in, in progressive stages from classical paganism to Christendom and on to modern secularism is well entrenched and by now almost instinctive with us. We almost automatically refer to it, for example, in understanding our current cultural struggles. So conflicts over marriage or abortion uh, or education or religious freedom are often seen as pitting traditional religion and religious ideas and constituencies against progressive, secular, uh, and, and progressive ideas. 
Now it's true that by now most observers will admit that religion hasn't declined as decisively as had once been anticipated. And it may even be that the triumph of secularism is not as inevitable as was once thought. Even so, those are the viable alternatives, Christianity or religion more generally, and secularism, not paganism. In the face of this objection, I'm nonetheless interested in exploring Eliot's thesis primarily for the same reason that he offered it. At the outset of his lectures, Eliot explained that he was advancing his unconventional interpretation in response to, quote, immediate perplexities that fill our minds. He declared as well his suspicion that the current terms in which we discuss international affairs and political theory may only tend to conceal from us the real issues of contemporary civilization. As it happens, I have a similar suspicion. For example, uh, to me, and I'm hardly alone in this, the secular versus religious interpretations of current culture war conflicts increasingly seem inadequate. Eliot's suggestion just might offer a more illuminating way of understanding what's going on, which is why I want to try to defend Eliot's thesis in these lectures and in a longer project from which they're taken, and to apply the thesis to some of our current cultural struggles. At the outset, though, I need to make emphatically the same disclaimer Eliot did, this is a subject, he said, which I could no doubt handle much better were I a profound scholar in any of several fields. That caveat applies to me a fortiori. I'm not a renowned poet or a historian, a classicist, a philosopher, or a theologian. I'm just a law professor teaching at a respectable but modest university. And yet in this lecture, I'll be saying quite a lot about religion and about Roman and early Christian history. Given my lack of expertise, my only excuse for doing this is that I've come to think it's necessary in order to illuminate the more contemporary controversies that I do teach and write about and that most of us these days think about. And so confessing my lack of qualifications, I propose to pursue Eliot's thesis and see where it may lead us. The first task, uh, it seems, would be to offer an account of what paganism is that might help make sense of Eliot's references to modern paganism. With apologies, but for purposes of this lecture, I'm gonna to try to do this pretty summarily. So for most people today, the term paganism probably elicits two main images. One is of capricious deities squabbling with each other on Mount Olympus and occasionally coming down to rescue some favored warrior or to consort with some especially fetching maiden. The other is of priests sacrificing bulls to Apollo or Zeus and guiding political decisions by studying the entrails of animals or the flights of birds. If this is what paganism is taken to mean, Eliot's diagnosis seems dead on arrival. No one of consequence today wants to return to that sort of thing. But must paganism be understood only in terms of these ancient stories and practices? Well, to address that question, it'll be helpful to begin with a broader category, religion. The term notoriously eludes definition, but for our purposes, religion can be understood in terms of two themes. One theme is the human need for meaning. The other is the human encounter with a reality often described as the sacred or the holy. So let me elaborate briefly. Growing out of his experience as a prisoner in the Nazi death camps, the psychologist Viktor Frankl argued that, quote, man's main concern is not to gain pleasure or to avoid pain, but rather to see a meaning in his life. In a similar vein, Rabbi Jonathan Sachs contends that we are meaning-seeking animals. It is what makes us unique. To be human is to ask the question, why? But what could provide that sort of meaning? Both Frankel and Sachs suggested that the answer ultimately lies in religion. Sachs quotes Wittgenstein, to believe in God means to understand the question about the meaning of life. To believe in God means to see that the facts of the world are not the end of the matter. To believe in God means to see that life has a meaning. Leaving for the moment that contention though and passing over some questions that occupy a large chunk of a chapter in the longer project, let me bring in the second theme the human encounter with the sacred or the holy. In his classic account, The Idea of the Holy, Rudolf Otto contended that the source of religion is the human experience of a transcendent reality, reality, the holy. The holy is sui generis, Otto thought, not reducible into anything else. Even so, he tried to ex explicate the concept mainly through a series of imperfect analogies. So Otto discussed similarities between the experience of the holy and the sense of awe, the horror and shudder in ghost stories, as he said, the sense of the sublime, the feeling of the erotic, and the blissful rejoicing, as he put it, experienced when listening to beautiful music. In a similar vein, Mircea Eliade, in his influential book, The Sacred and the Profane, connected religion to a sense of the sacred. The sacred is the manifestation of something of a wholly different order, a reality that does not belong to our world. 
Though different, the meaning and sacredness accounts of religion seem compatible, even convergent. The sacred or the holy is what confers meaning on the world, as Sachs and Wittgenstein suggested. Without the luxury of lingering over some important questions here, though, we now need to ask a further question leading to a key distinction. Where, so to speak, is the sacred? Where is it situated exactly? Simplifying, we might say that answers to that question have fallen into two main families. One answer, we can call it the imminent view, locates the sacred within nature or within the world. This was and is the pagan position. The pagan gods were, after all, often within this world. They were, as James O'Donnell explains, the mightiest part of the world itself, not beings that somehow stood outside it all. The other answer, the transcendent answer, asserts that the holy is ultimately a reality lying outside nature or beyond this world. Again, simplifying, we can say that this was and is the view of Judaism and Christianity. In this vein, Abraham Heschel contrasted ancient Greek religion with what he called biblical man. Greek religion identified the sublime with nature and with the world. In essence, it sacralized the world. By contrast, biblical man understood the sublime as a manifestation of something or someone who stood behind and above nature and the world. Augustine made the point in, in poetic terms. And what is this God that I love? He wrote in his confessions. I asked the earth and it said, I am not he. And everything in the earth made the same confession. I asked the sea and the deeps and the creeping things. And they replied, we are not your God. Seek above us. I asked the fleeting winds and the whole air with its inhabitants answered. And Aximenes was deceived. I am not God. I asked the heavens, the sun, moon, and stars. And they answered, neither are we the gods whom you seek. And I replied to all these things which stand around the door of my flesh. You have told me about my God that you are not he. Tell me something about him. And with a loud voice, they all cried out, he made us. In light of this crucial distinction, we might say that paganism refers to a religious orientation that locates the sacred within this world. Historically, paganism has manifested itself in a dazzling variety of outward forms, but its essence lies in its imminent sacralizing tendency. Now, in this respect, I think I'm merely following a pattern of thought already evident in antiquity. Thus, in the first century BC, the scholar Marcus Varro distinguished among three forms of Roman religion, the mythical, the civic, and the philosophical. It was entirely possible to scoff at the mythical religion, as Varro himself did, along with many other educated Romans, and even to disdain the civic religion, the auspices, sacrifices, and so forth, as Seneca did, at least according to Augustine, while devoutly adhering to pagan religion in a philosophical sense. There are complicated questions here, but I'm suggesting that the philosophizing of Stoic and Neoplatonic pagans amounted to an effort to defend the sacralization of nature while abandoning at least literal belief in the pagan deities. And I note as well that something like this conception also seems to inform Yale Law Dean Anthony Cronman's massive spiritual philosophical tome published last year and reaching over 1,100 pages entitled Confessions of a Born Again Pagan. So let's take paganism as a label for imminent religiosity. And let's say that Christianity believes instead in a transcendent God, or perhaps more accurately, in a God who, though imminent and even incarnate, is also an ultimately transcendent. Scholars like the German Egyptologist Jan Osman or the Israeli historian Guy Strumsa suggest that the shift from the imminent religiosity of paganism to the transcendent religiosity of later Judaism and Christianity represented a kind of revolution with, as Strumsa puts it, decisive consequences for the future of Western culture. As Strumsa's observation suggests, the difference between imminent and transcendent religion wasn't merely theoretical. Rather, the different religiosities supported fundamentally different attitudes toward the world, different existential orientations, if you like. The polytheistic religion of antiquity, says Osman, quote, seeks to make its votaries at home in the world. By contrast, the monotheistic view, uh, the monotheistic, excuse me, Jew or Christian, quote, does not feel entirely at home in the world anymore. Christians were in the world, as the saying goes, but they aspired to be not of the world. And these different existential orientations have profoundly different uh, practical implications. Let me briefly discuss two of these. And the subtitle for this next part of the lecture might be Sex in the City. So one divergence was apparent in the area of sexual morality. Pagan Rome was, as Norman Cantor puts it, a sexual paradise. For men, anyway, respectable women were held to a very different standard of chastity. But for men, readily available sex provided sensual gratification, of course. But more than that, it was a sort of religious performance or duty. Historian Kyle Harper reports in a recent study that 
quote, sexual passion was viewed as an imminent divine force, the mysterious indwelling presence of the gods. Roman novels, Harper says, convey a picture of, quote, a world keenly knit by the gods so that mankind might find in erotic fulfillment nothing short of salvation. Given this vision, Roman society provided ample means for sexual fulfillment. Brothels dotted the cityscape like Starbucks or Taco Bells in a modern American city. Not Princeton, however, I couldn't find a Taco Bell anywhere this afternoon, but um, sex was cheap, less than the cost of a latte or a bean burrito. The historian Dio Chrysostom observed that brothels, quote, are apparent everywhere in the city, at the governor's porch, in the marketplaces, by the buildings, both civil and religious, right in the middle of what ought to be most revered. Suetonius reported that the Emperor Caligula sponsored an imperial brothel and, quote, stocked it with married women and freeborn boys and then sent his pages around the squares and public places, inviting men of all ages to come and enjoy themselves on credit if necessary. As you may notice in the tone of these descriptions, more aristocratic Romans might disapprove of prostitution, not as immoral, but as squalid, as Harper puts it. They objected to sharing sexual receptacles much in the way you or I might complain if we went to a restaurant and the server expected us to eat off the same place that the previous patrons had already used. But not to worry, the well-off owned slaves, possibly hundreds of them, which made it unnecessary to resort to prostitutes. Sex with slaves was perfectly acceptable because as one Roman author put it, every master is held to have it in his power to use his slave as he wishes. For the most part, Roman culture was indifferent to whether sexual satisfaction was achieved with same-sex or opposite-sex partners, but there was one severe constraint, namely the ethic of manliness or machismo, if you like. So although homosexual conduct was permissible, it was disgraceful for a man to be the passive partner or to fulfill the function ascribed to a woman. Sarah Rudin reports that, quote, to keep it unmistakable that he had no sympathy with passive homosexuals, a man would tout his attacks on vulnerable young males. Another corollary of manliness was the cultivation of self-mastery. So sexual desires were to be gratified, certainly, but a man who allowed his sexual passions to gain mastery of him was less than virtuous, just as a man who could not control any other passion was deserving of criticism. By contrast to pagan morality, Christian sexual ethics represented, as Kyle Harper explains, a paradigm shift and a deep earthquake in human morality. The most obvious change was in the specific rules and prohibitions. For Christians, sex was permissible only within marriage. For both men and women, no more double standard. Prostitution, homosexual relations, and pederasty were all forbidden. Even more important than the specific prohibitions, though, according to Harper, was the new foundational logic of sexual ethics. In the Christian view, the human body was a temple of the Holy Spirit, as the Apostle Paul had said. Unsanctioned sex functioned to desecrate that temple. In this way, Harper argues, sexual morality, quote, came to mark the great divide between Christians and the world. But the divergence wrought by the Christian revolution wasn't limited to sex. Another decisive difference concerned attitudes toward the city or toward the political order. In paganism, devotion to the gods and loyalty to the city were basically one and the same thing. Christians, by contrast, distinguished sharply between God and Caesar. They were commanded to be loyal to both authorities, true, but their highest allegiance was to God. For pagans, this attitude was corrosive of the civic religion that supported the city, and they sometimes punished the followers of Jesus by sending them off to the Colosseum or the mines. Christians found this treatment unjust, naturally, but also puzzling. In a protest addressed to the rulers of the Roman Empire, the feisty Christian lawyer Tertullian protested, the Christians were in most respects no different from other Romans. Quote, we sojourn with you in the world, abjuring neither forum, nor slaughterhouse, nor bath, nor booth, nor workshop, nor inn, nor weekly market, nor any other places of commerce. We sail with you and fight with you and till the ground with you. Tertullian went on, without ceasing for all our emperors, we offer prayer. We pray for life prolonged, for security to the empire, for protection to the imperial house, for brave armies, a faithful senate, a virtuous people, the world at rest, whatever as man or Caesar and emperor would wish. And yet, with our hands thus stretched out and up to God, you rend us with your iron claws, hang us up on crosses, wrap us in flames, take our heads from us with the sword, let loose the wild beasts upon us. But the problem, basically, was that the kind of allegiance that Tertullian and other Christians offered was not what Roman authorities required. In many settings, the authorities demanded that subjects sacrifice to the gods, including the divine emperors. Christians sometimes complied, but often refused. In this respect, as with sexual morality, the Christian stance might seem to the pagans almost incomprehensible. 
After all, virtually nothing was being asked of them, or so it seemed. Cambridge historian Keith Hopkins imagines an educated pagan pressing the question on a Christian friend. Why can't you compromise? It surely wouldn't be too dreadful if someone told you Christians to take an oath by an emperor or pour a simple libation to the emperor's health. Could you just participate in our public festivals for the sake of form? More generally, it seems that many Romans were or would have been willing to accept the Christian God into the polytheistic pantheon on the same terms of reciprocity under which so many other deities had been absorbed to form a sort of proto rawlsian overlapping consensus. <laughs> we'll accept your God if you'll accept ours. What could be more fair than that? In this spirit, the Emperor Alexander Severus actually did place a statue of Jesus in his private chapel along with some other gods. There was even a rumor that Alexander intended to erect a temple to Jesus. And yet the more committed Christians were unwilling to accept inclusion on these terms. They understood, even if the pagans couldn't, that to do so would be in essence to repudiate their faith. As Lactantius explained, if the honor paid to Christ is shared by others, he altogether ceases to be worshiped, since his religion requires us to believe that he is the one and only God. So the general Roman policy, benignly understood by Romans as, we'll accept you and your God if you'll accept ours, inevitably sounded to the Christians like insulting double talk. We'll accept your religion if you will effect effectively repudiate it and accept our pagan religion instead. Given this Christian refusal, Roman authorities naturally responded harshly. In the early centuries, the response took the form of episodic but savage persecutions. In the fourth century, these conflicts escalated into a back and forth struggle. Early in that century, in the Great Persecution, the Emperor Diocletian and his colleagues attempted to eradicate Christianity, inflicting savage punishments. Then fortunes flipped as Constantine and his successor Constantius first commanded toleration and later began to confer special privileges on Christians. Upon Constantius's death, though, things turned again. The flamboyantly pagan Emperor Julian attempted to bring about a revival of paganism, including by barring Christians from teaching in the schools. Some historians believe that if Julian had lived longer, his pagan revival might well have succeeded. But Julian was killed in an ill-advised invasion of Persia, and later emperors episodically returned to favoring Christianity. By the end of the century, Christianity had officially at least prevailed. And how did Christianity achieve this political success? Some historians point to coercive prohibitions issued by Christian emperors. But other historians observe that these laws were so little enforced that they seem to have gone almost entirely unnoticed by prominent pagans at the time. It seems that the decisive struggle occurred not so much through coercion as through public symbols. So Christian emperors built impressive churches, often on the sites previously occupied by pagan temples. Julian, the pagan emperor, reversed this process, and he was in turn reversed by his Christian successors. By dominating the city skyline, so to speak, these churches and temples communicated to citizens the character of the city they inhabited. One especially contentious symbol was the so-called Altar of Victory, a pagan shrine that had been prominently placed next to the door of the Senate House by the first emperor, Augustus. The Christian emperor Constantius ordered the altar removed. The pagan emperor Julian had it restored. Later, the Christian emperor Gratian again had the altar taken down, and so the pagan senator Symmachus wrote an eloquent plea re requesting restoration of the altar, a plea that was in turn stoutly opposed by Milan's influential uh, Bishop Ambrose. All of the disputants in this controversy recognized the symbolic importance of the shrine. We might say that they implicitly understood the theme of a more recent much admired book by Benedict Anderson called Imagined Communities. What transforms a collection of people into a community is not simply the fact of geographic proximity. Communities are conjured up and consolidated rather in people's imaginations, in their minds and souls. People constitute a community because they think of themselves or imagine themselves as a community. And the imaginings that create a community form around and in response to and express and maintain themselves in public symbols. Symbols express the community in other words but they also help to constitute the community. It's a crucial point, and we'll return to it when we consider contemporary controversies over public symbols, like the words under God and the Pledge of Allegiance and crosses on public property. By controlling the public symbols, Christians like Ambrose managed to reconstitute the empire as Christian, officially at least. It was a portentous transformation and one that we've been living with ever since. Jan Osman argues that the shift from the this-worldly religiosity of, of uh, antiquity to the 
monotheistic face of later Judaism and Christianity, quote, has had a more profound impact on the world we live in today than any political upheaval. Whether that change has been a happy one is, of course, a disputed question. University of Pennsylvania sociology professor Ross Koppel remarks that, quote, on a macro level, the net effects of religion and faith are a few thousand years of horrible wars, genocide, slavery, sexual exploitation, torture, devaluing others as not human, terrorism, and organized hatred. That's a common enough view among the intelligentsia, and the criticism is often directed specifically against Christianity. It is an affectionate history of the Enlightenment as the rise of modern paganism, the historian Peter Gay presents the movement as, quote, a great campaign against Christianity. Gay describes David Hume on his deathbed, lamenting that he had failed to free his countrymen from, as Hume put it, the Christian superstition. Hume worried that the English were, quote, relapsing into the deepest stupidity, Christianity, and ignorance. So successful were Enlightenment thinkers like Hume and Voltaire in associating Christianity with ignorance and intolerance that the association has become, in many literary or intellectual circles, at least virtually an axiom, the later polemicists have been able to rely on pretty much free of effort or risk. So intellectuals can speak sneeringly about Christians or Christian institutions, thereby signaling their own sophistication and their noble commitment to freedom, tolerance, and reason without fear of being seriously challenged by their peers. Indeed, the culture despisers can express their disdain and have been expressing it over and over again for decades and even centuries, and ironically, can still somehow suppose themselves to be exhibiting a kind of avant-garde courage and independence of mind. But a different judgment is also available. David Bentley Hart asserts that even the most ardent secularists among us generally cling to notions of human rights, economic and social justice, providence for the indigent, legal equality, or basic human dignity, the pre-Christian Western culture would have found not so much foolish as unintelligible. It is simply the case that we distant children of the pagans would not be able to believe in any of these things. They would never have occurred to us had our ancestors not once believed that God is love, that charity is the foundation of all virtues, that all of us are equal before the eyes of God, that to fail to feed the hungry or care for the suffering is to sin against Christ, and that Christ laid down his life for the least of his brethren. I won't try to adjudicate here between Hume's and Hart's assessments, but it's a question to keep in mind as we move from the ancient world into more contemporary issues. I now want to try to make that transition by fast forwarding to the present. So the rest of this lecture will be about the return of the pagan. Because paganism has returned, I will suggest, though mostly in a kind of disguise. How has this happened? Well, as I mentioned at the beginning of the lecture, the common assumption is that the modern world has left behind both pagan antiquity and medieval Christendom and has evolved into a world that is secular. And the brave new worldview of our modern secular age is supposedly something like the philosophy of scientific naturalism. Thus, after sympathetic depictions of the classical Greek and Christian worldviews, the philosopher Luke Ferry pronounces that science has rendered these views unavailable. Quote, neither the ancient model nor the Christian model remain credible for anyone of a critical and informed disposition. The secularization associated with a naturalistic worldview implies, as Max Weber put it, the disenchantment of the world. Secularism can thus be viewed as completing a process that Christianity set in motion. The classical world was enchanted. It was full of gods. Every hill, every valley, every stream or lake had its proper deity. Judaism and then Christianity banished all of these gods in favor of the one true God, a stern and lofty sovereign, though, who was metaphysically detached from time and space, so the world itself became less immediately charged with divinity. The naturalism of modern secularism, in turn, dissolves that far-off God as well, leaving the cosmos bereft of sacredness and enchantment altogether. A poignant but quietly heroic, or perhaps mock heroic, statement of this spiritually barren condition comes from the philosopher Bertrand Russell. That man is the product of causes which had no provision of the end they were achieving. That his origin, his growth, his hopes and fears, his loves and his beliefs are but the outcome of accidental collocations of atoms. That no fire, no heroism, no intensity of thought and feeling can preserve an individual life beyond the grave. That all the labors of the ages, all the devotion, all the inspiration, all the noonday brightness of human genius are destined to extinction in the vast death of the solar system, and that the whole temple of man's achievement must inevitably be buried beneath the debris of a universe in ruins, all these things, if not quite beyond dispute, are yet so nearly certain that no philosophy which rejects them can hope to stand. Only within the scaffolding of these truths, only on the firm foundation of unyielding despair, can the soul's habitation henceforth be safely built. <clears throat> 
As this picture began to emerge in the course of secularization, a question was often raised along with it. Can human beings actually live under the apprehension of such a forbiddingly barren world? Writing in the aftermath of World War II, Princeton philosopher Walter Stace was doubtful. Science, he said, had given us a new imaginative picture of the world. The world, according to this new picture, is purposeless, senseless, meaningless. Nature is nothing but matter in motion. This new worldview, Stace thought, quote, though silent and unnoticed was the greatest revolution in human history, far outweighing in importance any of the political revolutions whose thunder has reverberated through the world. That was because, quote, if the thing, scheme of things is purposeless and meaningless, then the life of man is purposeless and meaningless too. Everything is futile. All effort is in the end worthless. And yet it seems that Russell and Stace and the various prophets of secularization have proven to be highly fallible prognosticators. Religion has emphatically not withered away. In many contexts, it appears to be more vibrant than ever. So what has happened? Part of the answer is well known. Traditional transcendent religion, uh, Christianity, Judaism, especially uh, Islam, of course, have proven to be more resilient than many had expected. That much, I think, is obvious. But I'm interested here in a different development, namely the revival of a commitment to the sacred in a more surprising and thoroughly secular cultural neighborhood. And considering this development, for tonight at least, I want to focus on one important representative figure, Ronald Dworkin. Though a thoroughly secular thinker, Dworkin resisted the pervasively instrumentalist character of modern legal thought. He championed rights, rights understood as trumps or categorical constraints on consequentialist policies. He argued for the importance in law of principles derived from moral philosophy. But in a secular, naturalistic world, where were these categorical constraints and moral imperatives supposed to come from? Dworkin's career, I think, might be perceived as one long struggle with that question. In an early essay, he appeared to embrace a kind of refined moral conventionalism. But this seemed a vulnerable position. So Dworkin later came out in favor of what he at least called moral realism. In the same essay, though, while declaring that morality was objective, Dworkin also insisted that it was not actually any sort of object. Morality is not part of the fabric of the universe, as he put it. This stance left some readers, or at least one, feeling a bit disgruntled. If morality isn't part of the fabric of the universe, in what sense is it real or objective at all? At about the same time, in an exploration of life and death issues such as abortion and euthanasia, Dworkin invoked the idea of the sacred. He insisted the sacred need not be a religious concept, and he emphasized the distinction between sacred or inviolable values and merely instrumental values. And yet Dworkin's explication of the sacred seemed both half-baked and admittedly half-hearted. Once detached from its religious moorings, what does sacred even mean? Dworkin proposed that we regard some things as sacred because they're the results of a long process we admire, such as artistic creation or natural evolution. We consider a great painting sacred because the artist put a lot of time and effort and genius into painting it. And we regret the loss of a species of plant or animal because it was the product of eons of evolution. So its disappearance would amount to, quote, a waste of nature's investment. This seemed a curious and uncompelling explanation. If it turned out that da Vinci had dashed off the Mona Lisa in a week, would we then demote it from the category of masterpiece? And Dworkin con conceded that, quote, we don't treat everything produced by a long natural process. Coal or petroleum deposits, for example, is inviolable. In the face of such reservations, Dworkin didn't attempt even to, didn't really attempt to actually defend his process and loss of investment account of the sacred. Instead, he claimed merely be, to be describing intuitions that many people supposedly have. And for his own part, he expressed doubts about whether these intuitions are ultimately justifiable at all. It is not my present purpose, he said, to recommend or defend any of these widespread convictions about art and nature in either the religious or secular form. Perhaps they are all, as some skeptics insist, inconsistent superstitions. Dworkin's convoluted discussion thus amounted to a tentative effort to support his anti-instrumentalist commitments by tapping into a religious notion, the sacred, even though he was by his own admission unable to provide any persuasive defense of the concept. And so in his last posthumously published book, Dworkin explicitly embraced religion, albeit religious atheism, as he called it. Religion, he argued, need not include belief in God or gods. Rather, what he called the religious attitude rests on two beliefs or judgments. The first is that, quote, human life has objective meaning or purpose. The second is that what we call nature, the universe as a whole and in all its parts, is not just a matter of fact, but is itself sublime, something of intrinsic value and wonder. 
we should, quote, take these two values, life's intrinsic meaning and nature's intrinsic beauty, as paradigms of a fully religious attitude to life. As it happens, the two commitments identified by Dworkin correspond almost exactly to the two-themed account of religion we considered earlier. One theme associated with thinkers like Viktor Frankl and Jonathan Sachs sees religion as an affirmative response to the human need for meaning. This is the first of Dworkin's elements of religion. The other theme, articulated by Rudolf Otto and Abraham Heschel, understands religion in terms of the human experience of the sublime or the sacred. This is Dworkin's second element. Unlike for those thinkers, though, for Dworkin, sublimity is a property of nature itself. In this sense, Dworkin's religion would seem to be of the imminent variety. This imminent quality is perhaps most clearly apparent in Dworkin's admiring discussion of Spinoza and Einstein. Spinoza, he observed, often talked about God. But, quote, Spinoza's God is not an intelligence who stands outside everything and who, through the force of its will, has created the universe. His God is just the complete set of physical laws considered under a different aspect. Under what aspect? Here, Dworkin invoked Einstein. Einstein, quote, did not believe in a personal God, Dworkin explained, but he did worship nature. He regarded it with awe and thought that he and other scientists should be humble before its beauty and mystery. In proposing this imminent religiosity, Dworkin didn't purport to be offering any novel insight. Rather, he claimed, quote, many millions of people who count themselves as atheists for his fellowship. Maybe he was exaggerating, and yet there's reason to suspect just the opposite. Recent research by the Pew Foundation suggests that between 2007 and 2014, the percentage of atheists who reported feeling a sense of awe or wonder about the universe increased from 37 to 54 percent. For self-identifying agnostics, the increase went from 48 to 55 percent. Dworkin's description might also fit the growing fold of people who describe themselves as spiritual but not religious. And it might fit the swelling portion of Americans who are classified as nuns, people who on surveys of religiosity mark the box for none. While skeptical about or hostile to conventional religion, many of them would likely share the kinds of judgments about meaning and beauty described by Dworkin. Indeed, even many who self-identify with more traditional religions might more accurately belong in the camp of the imminently religious. This contingent might well include the vast ranks of the religiously lukewarm, people who for reasons of habit or family tradition may self-identify as Catholic or Methodist or whatever, and who do indeed have the kinds of experiences of beauty and value that Dworkin described, but who exhibit no genuine commitment to a transcendent deity. And even active churchgoers may recite the ancient Christian creeds and yet maintain a faith in something more imminent than transcendent. In short, Dworkin's odyssey from moral conventionalism to a disembodied moral realism, to a vague and undefended sacredness, all the way across to imminent religiosity, reflects what has become a familiar trajectory. At stage one, secularists look back, wistfully perhaps, on the enchanted world of antiquity and pronounce that world, alas, irretrievably lost. The first reaction to this loss sometimes is to announce the meaninglessness of the world. Great God, they may say sadly, along with Wordsworth, I'd rather be a pagan suckled in a creed outworn. The announcement may be offered with resigned despair, as with Stace, or perhaps as with Russell with the darkly heroic satisfaction of Homeric warriors who are all the more admirable because they fight courageously on, knowing that they must soon die and that will be the end of everything. And then, upon reflection, secular thinkers declare that we can have morality after all. And upon further thought, they announce the glad tidings that the secular world is not as empty of enchantment or objective value as had been supposed. It turns out that amidst the nothing but matter in motion, as Stace put it, there's also beauty, value, goodness, enchantment, sublimity, the sacred. Nor are these merely subjective emotions. They're objectively real. Why had we somehow supposed that they had been lost? What was the reason for all of our existential angst? Why were we, or in any case our parents, so taken with Sartre and Camus and Samuel Beckett? What could we or they have been thinking? So, is the upshot that secularization is a myth, that it hasn't happened and is not going to happen? Well, not exactly. But the fact that the story of secularization hasn't unfolded according to script might prompt us to go back and examine the notion of the secular more closely, as in fact a lot of scholars have been doing. Historically, the term traces back to the Latin term seculum, meaning generation or age. The original sense of the term evidently is something like of this age or of this world. Pagan religion and pagan deities, as we've seen, were of this world. So paganism might be described as a thoroughly secular species of religiosity. With Christianity, which emphasized the difference between this world and the next, the term began to serve a new function. 
now at work to distinguish this world, the here and now, from the next life or from eternity. But the term still emphatically didn't mean not religious. Thus, the common term secular clergy refers not to priests who have lost their faith, but rather to priests who perform their religious work in the world, in a parish, as opposed to the regular clergy, or in other words, priests who retreat from the world to the rule or regula of a monastery. Then, in early mo modernity, usage changed. Secular came to acquire its more standard contemporary meaning of not religious. We might describe this as the, the positivistic conception of the secular in contrast to the Christian and pagan versions. It was this positivistic secularism that was ostensibly foreordained to dominate modern thought and culture. In some histories handed down to us three broad categories or families of the secular. There's the pagan secular, in which emphasis is placed on this world and this life, but this world and this life are viewed as having a sacred quality. Then there's the Christian secular, in which the sacred lies beyond time and space, and this temporal world and this life are a specialized area of God's domain, as Naomi Stolzenberg puts it. As such, this life has value, indeed immense value, but and because it's a subordinate piece of, a of the larger domain of eternity. Finally, there's the distinctively modern positivistic secular reflected in the worldview associated with modern science. This is the not religious and disenchanted world of Weber, Russell, and company. Each of these versions of the secular remains available to people today. Positivistic secularism seems to be the official version, so to speak, and the one that naturally comes to mind when we hear the word secular, um, because that's uh, the one that doesn't involve religion. And yet, although there's no way to take an accurate headcount in practice, it seems likely that the positivistic version actually has the fewest real disciples. Nearly everyone, for example, will assert that human life is sacred or that human persons have inviolable value or dignity. And maybe there are exceptions. The playwright George Bernard Shaw, for example, throughout his life, John Gray reports, the great playwright argued in favor of mass extermination as an alternative to imprisonment. It was better to kill the socially useless, he urged, than to waste public money locking them up. But if this was indeed Shaw's position, nearly all of us, whether we self-identify as liberal or conservative or as religious or secular, would react to it with horror because we would say, Human life is sacred or inviolable or infinitely precious or something of that sort. Insofar as we insist on some such proposition, we depart from the positivistic secular in favor of something else, perhaps the transcendent secularism uh, of traditional Christianity, or perhaps the more imminent sacredness of, um, of uh, the modern paganism. So in conclusion, I think it's entirely possible to describe the modern world as secular and not inaccurate. The term isn't so much wrong as uninformative. It leaves open and indeed serves to conceal the crucial question. What kind of secular? Secular in what sense? Positivistic secularism may be appropriate to our scientific enterprises. In the moral and political realms, or in the realm of the city, in other words, it seems that Eliot may have been closer to the mark in suggesting that the live choices between the imminent religiosity of the pagan secular and the more transcendent religiosity of the Christian or Judeo-Christian secular. Acknowledging the cogency of Eliot's description might be valuable in helping us understand our contemporary situation. Instead of thinking of, say, the culture wars that rage in the US and elsewhere in the unrevealing terms of secular versus religious, for example, we might more helpfully understand them as a clash of competing religiosities. And the ideas or movements that go and often go into the labels of secular or progressive might be understood as attempts to undo the Christian revolution of the fourth century in favor of a newer orthodoxy, or perhaps a new version of an older orthodoxy that believes in the sacred to be sure, and whose adherents can be every bit as zealous as Christians, and every bit as capable of being sanctimonious or self-righteous or dogmatic, but that repudiates the transcendent sacredness of Judaism and Christianity and instead locates the sacred within this world. I'm gonna to try to develop this interpretation in more detail in the next lecture um, by looking more closely at current conflicts over public symbols, sexual morality, and religious freedom, and by suggesting that we can understand these as a kind of pagan counter-revolution attempting to undo the Christian revolution of the fourth century. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Smith. Uh, the floor is open for uh, Q&A. Uh, Chanel has a microphone. We're catching everything, trying to catch everything uh, on, the, uh, on the videotape. So wait for Chanel to bring the microphone along. Professor Forte. Thank you. Should I stand up here? Uh, well, I think you've got, yeah, you can stand. Yeah, okay. uh, thank you, Stephen. Thank you. 
thank you very much. In your uh, tripartite uh, distinction of, of uh, forms of secularism, um, where would you put the modern version of Gnosticism? It doesn't seem to be worshiping the material the way your secular pagan is, nor is it this merger of the transcendent having a presence which is the Christian religious view in the world, nor is it positivistic materialism. Uh, and, and it would seem that Gnosticism is a very strong uh, element in today's uh, panoply of ideologies. How would you characterize that for us, please? Well, you know, these are sort of broad. I think ancient Gnosticism was a very diverse phenomenon, actually, you know, and modern movements that go into the heading of Gnosticism may be somewhat diverse, too. But hopefully this will be responsive. I think um, um, Carl Broughton and Robert Jensen, I think, a uh, couple of uh, Protestant theologians have a book, uh, the title of which I've forgotten, but it's something, of, something about neo-paganism. They talk about Gnosticism as a version of modern paganism. And by that, they understand something like the same thing I think that Ross Douthat in his book, Bought, uh, God, uh, let's see, Bad Religion is his book. He describes a number of modern sort of heresies and so forth. And he, uh, one of the common ones he describes is like the God within movement, which I think is the same thing that Broughton and Jensen talk about in terms of Gnosticism. So it, insofar as that's uh, a sort of modern phenomenon that's sometimes described with that term, I'd put that under the heading of uh, a sort of a, a kind of paganism, I think. Now, at a recent conference, sort of a round table on the book manuscript that Rick Garnett sponsored at Notre Dame, um, there, a number of people did disagree with my assessment uh, towards the end uh, of the, the book, actually. And there was a bit of an argument uh, about whether it was more accurate to describe some modern phenomena as pagan or as Christian heresies. Um, Douthat, I think, describes them as Christian heresies. I was a, a bit of, at a bit of a loss, though, because I just didn't see that as, you know, you had to put something on one side or the other. I mean, <laughs> Christian heresies might well be, you know, forms of, uh, forms of imminent, the kind of imminent religiosity that I would describe as paganism. But I would definitely, uh, if that's what the term is referred to, I don't, you might have something else in mind, but insofar as that's what the term Gnosticism sometimes is taken to mean today. I'd call that a version of paganism. Uh, Professor Story. Hello. Um, so I also had a question about your tripart structure, um, and particularly the, the third alternative, the contemporary paganism, which you characterize today anyway by talking about uh, Dworkin. So in comparison to the other two um, options, that, that option just seems uh, certainly not as memorable as the ancient paganism option and just kind of lame. Like it doesn't seem like a compelling religion. It's not even really as compelling as the Weberian alternative that you, um, that you brought up, right? And it seems to me that Weber, the Christian religion, and the ancient pagan religion all had in common in your portrayal, which I think seems right. Um, some view of the human being as godlike, as made in the image of God, although different, right? Um, but how does Dworkin see that? Or maybe would you need to draw on people other than Dworkin, I don't know, to present contemporary paganism as more kind of, uh, as, as, as something more compelling? <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, excellent point, excellent question. I, I tend to agree with you, but I don't think everybody does. Let me say, it, put this, um, I'll say a little bit more about that in the third lecture, and I say, a, quite a bit more about that towards the end of the book without attempting to decisively take, take a stand one way or the other, although I think my leanings are really clear I think, you know, when I get into it and so forth. But, um, but the modern paganism has certain advantages that I think for many people seem fairly compelling. One, it doesn't require you to believe very much. You know, I mean, you, you don't have to believe in deities on Mount Olympus and you don't have to believe in any sort of, you know, uh, Judeo-Christian God or anything like that, uh, that can be seen as a big advantage. And some people, I think, are quite explicit. Um, uh, in the book, I talk about a recent book that's really quite an intriguing one, I think, by, um, um, by uh, 
Barbara Ehrenreich, I think, called something like, um, I'm forgetting the title, but uh, she, she kind of mentioned it. She says, I've been an athe a lifelong atheist. I always will be. But on the other hand, she's had various sorts of spiritual experiences and so forth, epiphanies, you might say. And so I think those have pushed her definitely away from the positivistic uh, version of secularism. But she says quite explicitly at some points, you know, I, I came to realize that the only God I really objected to was the God of Abraham and, you know, and the, the God of the Bible and so forth. But pagan deities, naturalistic deities, um, so long as they didn't really ask much of you and didn't require you to believe anything, I have no problem with them. In fact, you know, so I think there is quite a lot uh, of advantage in it. I think it's also true that the pagan, sort of modern paganism doesn't impose, well, sin and judgment. And I, I sometimes think, you know, that one of the things about Christianity that has been most resented um, in, you know, not just in the last few decades, but for a long time, is that in a certain sense, it brought sinfulness and judgment, you know, as things that we had, had to deal with. I think ancient pagans sometimes felt that way. You know, they, that was one thing they resented about it. There's sort of like an all-seeing God who's watching your every move. And, um, and if you do wrong, you know, that you can understand at least why that might be oppressive. Now, in the end, I, I totally agree with you that um, the, um, I don't think the sort of modern paganism can provide the things that, you know, anything that will really make it attractive. But the last thing I'll say in response to that question is, um, and, and I'll have to admit here, I have not read the whole thing yet. I plan to read it. It's not the kind of book you could read, you know, in bits and pieces. But Tony Cronman's book, Confessions of a Born Again Pagan, is a really substantial, I have to give him credit, I think, thoughtful, a real work. And he thinks that modern paganism, properly understood, really can provide all those things. The last uh, sort of heading for his final chapters is joy, you know, and he thinks that it can. Now, the parts of the book that I've read, I have to admit, I'm sort of mystified by that because I think I haven't found the joy yet. You know, so somehow I, I don't quite understand the comfort and joy and somehow thinking we can imagine the whole thing as being under the aspect of some intelligence that informs it all, though not, it's not a personal sort of intelligence and it's not, you know, and that sort of thing. I don't see the joy in it, but he does. So uh, in fairness, probably you might want to look at that, you know, before, before deciding. Steve, you may, um, being out there in San Diego, hang around with a more easygoing class of modern pagan than I hang around. <laughs> but uh, it, it seems to me just from my own uh, experience with the tribe, uh, the, uh, uh, there are some pretty uh, demanding beliefs like the belief um, in the power of history to judge, uh, the belief in um, progress, uh, the, uh, the belief that, uh, uh, that, that history has a direction, uh, and there are harsh concepts of judgment, sin, uh, talk about in the wrong way about the environment or discrimination or uh, any of those sorts of issues. There are holy days, there are saints, there, it, it looks pretty full to me. Um, okay, well, I'm not making the claim, although I'm probably not qualified to make the claim one way or the other, but I'm not making the claim that modern paganism is a coherent is a coherent no, position, no, and I think, no, it's but I think, this. I mean, it seems uh, to me a demanding body of belief. But isn't it true, I think almost all of us have encountered the sort of person, because I think they're numerous, pretty much ubiquitous today, uh, and I, I don't want to engage in too much of a caricature or anything, but, uh, you know, who, um, the, they're for being non-judgmental and not biased and and so forth, and accepting, and of course, and uh, and can be quite not judgmental towards anybody except somebody who is sort of judgmental and uh, by their criteria. But there, you know, the hammer really comes down hard, and so forth. And and so, uh, you know, from an outsider's perspective, it can look like saying you're sort of for toleration and non judgmentalism, but it's just that you've shifted in who you're willing to be non judgmental toward and tolerant toward, and so forth. And whether that all adds up. to you know, it would be uh, presumptuous of me to say, to, to express my suspicion that it may not add up to a very coherent sort of position. But, but I, so I think it can be both. But I still think it's, it's true. Isn't it true, you know, that there are people say, look, we could all just get along if we wouldn't be judgmental and we can believe what we want and live the way we want to and that sort of thing. 
And if you don't agree, of course, we may crush you. But uh, but but still, it's I mean, really that's though, it's, uh, it's a different you know. issue than the one I'm raising. And I think that Jenna's raising. It's 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 not whether the view is coherent. It's it's uh, uh, it's not about whether there's a willingness to. Um, uh, come down hard on people who mm -hmm. are outside of the tribe or anything like that. It's just about the demandingness of the beliefs, that there are things that you've got to stick to or else you're, you're out, you're a heretic. You, and, and, it's, and it's not just easy. You've got you to gotta work at it. Yeah. Well, okay. I don't know. Maybe so. But, uh, I mean, in some of this sort of feeds right back into the sort of liberal thing about being neutral towards the idea of the good. You got to believe in that, but what you're supposed to believe in is that you're supposed to be neutral toward the, you know. So, yeah. so it's both appealing in the sense that it lets you have the idea of the good that you want, but you better believe, you know, in being neutral toward the idea of the good. So. Dr. Zach, but wait just a second, Brian, because Chanel will bring you the microphone. Thank you. Just a quick response to the last question. I would certainly be one of those uh, modern pagans. Uh, if I felt it, and if I agreed with you that it was necessary to distinguish paganism from secularism in order to give uh, worthwhile and value into the world, which I don't happen to agree with. But my question is actually slightly separate. Um, I'm wondering if you're going to be discussing Nietzsche, because in my understanding of what you discussed so far, in terms of um, meaning in the world, your options seem to be either there's no meaning at all, or there is objective meaning, which is either imminent through paganism or transcendent through Christianity. Mm -hmm. But Nietzsche, to me, at least gives, as a non-expert also, gives another option, which is that we are responsible for creating our own meaning. The meaning is, comes from uh, our own valuing and our own understanding of the world. Not out there, not from the gods. But there is meaning. Um. Uh, well, I won't be discussing that much. In, in the book, there's a, some reference to that towards the end, again. I won't be discussing it much. The sort of critical, but I will, I, I mean, I think, and this will come up actually in the third lecture for any, any who might actually uh, have the endurance to, you know, to, to, to listen to it. That I think that with respect to meaning, there are different sort of possible responses, uh, so, you know, what, uh, and, um, I categorize them into four, so I'll mention this again. You know, this is just kind of like the families of possible responses. One is there's no meaning either in human history or in individual lives. A second would be there is meaning in individual human lives, but not in history as a whole. A third would be there's meaning in history as a whole, maybe like a Marxist or a Hegelian view or something like that, but not really in individual human lives. Individual lives are just the ingredients, you know, of the meaning as a whole. And the final one would be that there is meaning as, uh, as uh, uh, both in history as a whole and in individual human lives. Now that we're the author of our own meaning, I'm not quite where, sure where to put that. Both uh, Frankel and Sachs, I think, explicitly say something like, it's not really meaning if it's just your own, you know, you can be the author of your own story, a common metaphor, right? You know, I want to, my, my life should make up a sort of a narrative structure and I'm the author of it. I, I'm not saying that one can't do that. Um, I mean, that might be fine. But I think from a certain point of view, that would not, that would not supply the kind of meaning that at least people like Frankel and Sachs say we're seeking, seeking in life. So that would be a quick, you know, not very complete response to that question. Professor Gregory. Yes, apologies. I came in late, and I fear my question may actually be uh, for a later lecture. But um, just to hear your thoughts, uh, I agree with the ending about to say secular is not wrong but unhelpful. And I like the way you reframed it as a clash of competing religiosities rather than the positivist um, religious versus secular. So if I share the diagnosis, my question is, does that make our predicament harder? Or how is it different from the positivist case? Because post-secular religiosity with God of the Dworkin kind often is pushed to um, declare or to kind of make the specialness of religion reduced whether it's in terms of legal protections or in social criticism, it's subsumed under a more general right. right. So now everyone is religious. And I think in some ways Dworkin pushed that in order to get rid of 
religious liberty as a special yeah. protection. Um, so if religion is now, on your terms, a uh, competing religiosities and not anchored to belief, but a phenomenology of religiosity, I just worry that that is too elastic um, to help us in kind of legal issues and social criticism, even though I share the social analysis. <laughs> Yeah, well, first of all, admit it is very elastic, and uh, this maybe is already apparent and perhaps partly in some answers I've already been trying to give to other questions. But just as I would say ancient paganism was, you know, paganism is a term. Some people don't even like the term for, for various reasons, but one is because it covers a lot, you know, and, and you could argue that it's unhelpful because it covers so much. I think it's still useful, but it does cover a lot. Uh, so there are a lot of different forms of it. That's true, I would say, today as well. And in that respect, uh, it, I don't think it illuminates a lot of, it just doesn't help particularly in illuminating a lot of things, although I, my claim would be that it is still illuminating in the sense that it sheds, you know, it helps us to understand the character of modern controversies, I think, more accurately than if we just think of them in terms of traditional religion versus something like positivistic secularism. I think, uh, and, I, and I think some of our difficulties in understanding that sometimes get translated into more practical difficulties in law and elsewhere are attributable to um, the sort of mischaracterization of secular with the implication of positivistic secular versus religion. So, so in that respect, I think it helps you know, to, to do this. But, there, but it doesn't help much in trying to explain why, say, modern paganism in this area or that time is taking this path rather than that. But it doesn't help much with that, I think. And, um, and, and it can also, it's true. I mean, you're exactly right, I think, about Dworkin, you know, in his last book. You know, the first chapter is about the religion without God that I've talked about. The last chapter kind of is, we don't need any special protection for religion then because, you know, everybody is religious. And, and, and so it does pose different kinds of questions and challenges in that respect, whether they'd ultimately be harder or, you know, than the old ones that we thought we were facing. I'm not sure if I have any general answer to that. The basic point, we don't live in a disenchanted age, but an always already enchanted in different ways by interpretation. Mm -hmm. by That's the and I think it would pose more clearly the sorts of choices and challenges that people need to confront, whether they're on more the transcendent side or the, or the, uh, or the, or the pagan side, if you want. And I hope I'm not using that term as a pejorative. I, I mean that to be, not to be a disrespectful term. I think Cronman's book, for example, is just, in that respect, the part of it I've read, which, and as I, as I say, at 1,100 pages, it's going to take a while to finish the whole thing, is exemplary in that respect. I think he's honest. I think he's um, put a lot of work and thought into it. And um, I, uh, now, when it comes to cultural issues, he's not really addressing those, and in fact, um, from my point of view, he, he, I think, would come out pretty much on my side of many of those legal and cultural issues and so forth. But he is trying to, and trying to address those things, and I think that's something probably we need to do, which we don't do if we keep thinking about things in, in the other term. So in that respect, I think, it's, I think it's helpful. But it will be different kinds of questions. Steve, on your account of uh, paganism, ancient and modern, the one glaring point of similarity would be the glorification of sexual licentiousness. But you haven't said too much about, you, you, you said- No, but if you come like, tomorrow night- Tomorrow night, yeah, I'll be too I'll, I'll say more we'll about that. give me a preview that. after dinner, yeah. yeah. I thank you so much, and I don't know if this will get covered in the next two days or not, but just to pick up from the last question, which is exactly right, where if everything is so elastic, that things, you know, we are considering various relig religiosities as mm -hmm. religion, we do wind up with a problem that both intrafaith and interfaith, um, there are groups that will consider the other intrafaith or interfaith as pagans. Mm -hmm. You know, you know, they don't. They, they will go to wherever they are supposed to deserve deservingly go to. But <laughs> inside that is really the question which I I always wind up with this problem that people are saying we are secular. Or, or this is supposed to be secular, or this process is supposed to be secular, yet they have their own religious beliefs, and I'm perfectly fine with that. What I, what I always wind up is that I, I think it would be much better, this is at least, and I like to hear your thoughts about this, 
it would be much better for, for the society, in my mind at least, that people openly declare their own religiosity or their own religious views, if any at all, and then say, by the way, these are my views, but I'm going to do this thing in this fashion, calling it secular. Mm -hmm. You know, I, 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 because I, I think this is like a smoke screen that we're saying on one hand that we are secular, and on the other hand, we are extremely religious because we have just done these six things that are very religious in, in their own processes. And so it's just trying to create a contradiction between itself I, and mm -hmm. leaving everybody confused. I, I think that's true. Now, Thank you. I, I don't think we can put too much blame on people for doing that because uh, I, I try and suggest in the book that this sort of secular versus religious dichotomy that's so pervasive, I think has made a lot of us opaque to ourselves. I, I, I don't think people, in other words, would say I'm secular and yet they do various things and seem to have various commitments that don't look like they're merely secular in the positivistic sense. I don't think they're being disingenuous or anything like that. I, I, I think, you know, those are the sort of categories that have been given to, you know, to, to most of us. And, and so we kind of fit ourselves into one or the other. And most of us probably are during the course of our lives trying to figure out what our deepest convictions are and so forth. So now, this, I would just say, is another one of the perplexities that fill our minds that Elliot referred to and then we, when he said um, the terms in which we debate these issues have caused us to misunderstand a great deal of what's actually at stake. But I agree with you that it would be helpful if we can do more to actually identify what the real beliefs are. And when you mentioned the smoke screen, this was something I probably should have said in response to Professor Gregory as well. But this is one area where I think that the um, secular versus religious dichotomy has done harm and that is in politics and political discourse, but in the specific area I work in the area of constitutional law and establishment clause jurisprudence, for example. Again, you know, the secular versus religious dichotomy is quite important there. But, you know, and I'll say more about this, a little more about it tomorrow, I think. But um, um, secular probably gets some of its respectability there by the sense that it's neutral is among religious positions and it's resonant with a sort of scientific worldview and so forth. But insofar as it's understood to include, uh, not to exclude, let's say, the imminently religious, it just does, I, I think, promotes a great deal of confusion and, uh, and even outcomes that I sometimes would think, you know, are not, uh, are not desirable. Uh, again, just under the heading, oh, but this is just secular. When you know it's not just secular, at least in some simple, obvious sense. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yes, sir, over here. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I hope this isn't a very naive question. It probably is, but uh, it's popularized by Richard Dawkins that um, religiosity uh, is a, an emergent, you know, property of our consciousness, and it seems like we have just. Uh, that a lot of the properties, as the uh, questioner over there you know, said, uh, they exist. Um, they exist through various mythologies, various descriptors of um, you know, how it comes about. Now, I, I, I'm a scientist, a retired scientist at the moment. And as a scientist, I really can't, um, during my work, uh, deal with um, a petitionable, intercessionary interventionist deity, I have to mm -hmm. assume that you know, my experiments reflect a basic yeah. reality, understanding that we live in a probabilistic world, but mm -hmm. you know, uh, under, understood that. So when, if Dawkins is correct, and I'm not saying that he is, but if he's correct, that it's an emergent property of our consciousness, um, and we have the situation that, at least to my knowledge, uh, there is no evidence, credible evidence, uh, showing the effectiveness of things such as uh, intercessionary prayer when the, the, the people are not uh, aware of the fact they're being you know, prayed for. Um, it just seems to me that the scientific realism uh, is, is a more adequate uh, descriptor of, of the world in, in, in a functional sense. So I don't know if this is a comment or a question, but um, you know, just. Well, I said, I, what, I think at the end of this lecture, I said something about how it may well be that positivistic secularism uh, is the appropriate position to take for our scientific enterprises and so forth. That, that might be so. Um, someone like uh, 
Jonathan Sachs, well, I mean, a lot of people have talked about this question, of course, but since I was talking about Jonathan Sachs, in his book, The Great Partnership, you know, he says, well, science is a wonderful, you know, a wonderful thing, and religion, he says, that it's a great partnership, but they're asking different kinds of questions. This, I don't know what you would think about this. I you know some people might think this is a little too cute or a little too tidy or something, but that science is more dealing with the question of sort of how and what, and that religion is dealing more with questions of why. Um, probably you'd want to refine that in various ways and so forth, but I think there's something, there's something to that. So I hope this is partly responsive to what you say. I mean, I, I agree that probably as a scientist, you're not going to be invoking, you know, theistic interventions to explain, you know, some observed phenomenon or anything. That's right. Pardon? Oh, you do? Oh, all well, right. Yeah. Yeah, right. Well. Jonathan Sachs says that science takes things apart to see how they work, and religion puts things together to see what they mean. I have a quote in the book, I think, from Alistair McGrath, another, I think, science-trained but theologian. Um, and I think he uses the example of a birthday cake or something, you know. He says, uh, uh, a scientist can take it apart and show you what all the chemicals are in it and so forth. But whether it was made for a birthday party or not, is something a scientist can't really tell you anything about. And I, I guess I think that's a little bit helpful, uh, hel helpful as well, you know, to think of them as not, not non-overlapping magisteria in the Stephen Jay Gould sense, but, you know, as both truth-oriented uh, inquiries and enterprises and so forth, but not concerned with exactly the same kinds of enterprises. So I, I hope that was at least partly responsive. Mm -hmm. uh, just getting back to Eliot for a moment. Uh, do you think, I mean, what he was seeing in 39, in term, 1939, in terms of the image of the secular state was national socialism, where there was a kind of religious belief imported into the state. Mm -hmm cut free from all of the theology that was behind a religious, traditional religious belief, but the intensity of that belief got imported into the state. Now, national socialism was purged as a heresy, in, and in turn, the second belief, communism, which also, Bolshevik communism, which also had that same kind of absoluteness of faith imported into the state, was also purged in the second half of the 20th century. Mm -hmm. So you can sort of, Think of secularism as moving, almost as a, as a belief, moving towards a greater refinement of its theology. Oh, well, maybe, well, at least changing it. I mean, that's always going on, I think. I, I mean, I, I think you're probably right that Eliot in 39, you might have said the, the big threats to the West Certainly would that's be what he was thinking of. Nazism and right. communism. That's what he was thinking I of. don't think he phrased the lectures in terms uh, I mean, he had reference to them, but I don't, th I think he pretty clearly didn't suggest it's only with respect to those movements that I'm talking. And I guess I don't think it would be accurate to say, and insofar as communism is no longer the competitor that it once was, and, and Nazism. No, no, no. I, the, I, I think the I, thesis I think what still he was seeing, a, he was seeing both of those movements as symptomatic yeah. of something in the secular state. Right. The need of the secular state to find that same kind of absoluteness. That uh -huh. same kind of form, that same kind of thing to hold on to, in terms of believing something you don't fully understand, you have faith in it, uh, and in some ways I think science is 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 now playing that role inside the secular state. When arguments are made on the basis of science, there's a sense that you really can't argue against them anymore. There's no longer any skepticism that can be brought to them. So I, I, in a way, I, I, think that, I think the secular state is finding a way to continue its existence, to grow, and I'll be interested in seeing what you have to say mm -hmm. in the second two lectures. One final point about Eliot in that book, that, I think that book is now very hard to get a hold of. I don't think it's been reprinted for a long, a long time. I bet if you get on Amazon, you can get it, I think. Well, but, as uh, a used book, you can get so. it. But you look at everything else that Eliot's written, and of course there are current editions of it, right? Including his poetry, two ma major publications mm -hmm. of, of his poetry. But that particular book, for some reason, was buried. Now there may be, I think there are certain comments in the book that Eliot was later embarrassed by, but the, the whole argument that he made at that, with that book has sort of lapsed. 
Maybe so, although it does get, I've noticed two or three recent books that kind of refer to it too, I think, you know, so I mean, it's not like it's uh, no longer of interest, you know, people are still aware of it, at least I think, and yeah. it's still coming. I'll, 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 so. Before the next lecture, I'll look and see when the last publication Okay, is. yeah, right. I just wanted to comment on the science thing. I'm a scientist, but I'm also a Roman Catholic. But, you know, referring to the question up there and here and what you said, you're right that if you, for example, this, well, science depends on expertise, which means you understand what it is you understand and you make very clear demarcations about what you can actually say about it. And mm -hmm. a good scientist ought to be practicing that. Mm -hmm. And that's where the humility comes in. You know, there's some of these things that you mentioned, which is true. I mean, even if you weren't religious, you're supposed to be practicing that ethic. But the problem comes in, as you said now, you've got this huge bunch of people that are all environmentalists. Climate change, and you know, here I am. I mean, it's, it's true that climate change is a problem, but unless I get very specific as a scientist, and then I have to rely on certain experts because it's outside of my area, even as a scientist, I've got to be careful about how I express my skepticism. And actually, there's a whole bunch of climate change activists who just be like, you know, raring in the streets, but they yeah. don't know the science. So right. they really haven't understood how to use scientific knowledge in balance with other ways of thinking. And you, you remember the scientific uh, consensus around the population bomb? Yeah, yeah it's just it's really a problem. Yeah. Uh, up, here, up there. I'm a retired attorney. You're a practicing law professor. And the question that I really have is that if I accept your argument, which seems both rational and logical, then I don't see where the court and the question of religious liberty comes in. You seem to be taking a position on religiosity as being on both sides of the fence. And so it would seem that as a legal proposition, the question of religious liberty is just to acknowledge that there's two sides on the fence and that therefore judicial intervention is not a proposition that's necessary. That in some, some means that if the court was to accept your position, the answer would often be, well, this is also a religious proposition that can be protected and standing on the other side that this is also a religious proposition that can be protected. So I'm, I'm somewhat, and I imagine, I see that tomorrow's on the culture war, so you may be addressing it there, but as, an, a constitution, uh, as a professor of constitutional law and a writer on religious liberty, what does this, what is your sense of a proposed judicial philosophy that would follow this? Well, I don't think any particular philosophy or like establishment or free exercise doctrine automatically follows from just noticing some of these developments and so forth. But I think, and I probably won't actually be saying a lot about this tomorrow, so I can probably say now. I think this is off the top of my head and in rough terms, but I'd say it, I think a good case could be made that in the American constitutional tradition, when we've talked about protecting the free exercise of religion, historically religion was understood, has been understood in the more transcendent terms. And it's been understood as um, meaning something like the government should not interfere so much as possible with a person's um, performance and living in accordance with what they believe to be God's, God's will for them, so forth. I mean, some, someone like James Madison you know, would have made that, I think, pretty clear in the memorial and remonstrance, you know, that he's talking about a, a religion as a relation to the creator, which is prior to any relations that we have to uh, civil society and uh, earthly governments and so forth. But that would be true before the doctrine of privacy was brought into the Constitution so that acts that were committed in privacy do not have to be justified in religious terms. Well, to put it, you know, again, this, this doesn't have to be, no doubt, elaborated and qualified in various ways, but I think one might say, traditionally, this probably was the basic rationale, and it still, in my view, would be quite a defensible rationale that would say something, 
there, there's a reason, a justification for a constitutional commitment to not interfering with the relation between human beings and their understanding of the, their obligations to their creator. Um, that's not based on privacy. Uh, 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 that gets reduced into privacy. We've totally transformed, I th uh, transformed it, I think. Now, that's not to say that there are not other constitutional commitments, some of which might be grounded in different sorts of conceptions of human dignity and, and privacy and so forth. But those, I would suggest, are quite different. And I, and I think we have, well, I'm not saying anything at all surprising if I say that the modern doctrines in these areas are quite confused. Nearly everyone seems to agree with that. And one reason why they're confused, I think, is because the rationales that went into the commitments have been obscured and so forth. And part of the way they've been obscured is, again, by this secular religious you know, thing that has not allowed us, I think, to really understand what's been going on. So, Professor Clays. There's a lot I agree with, but I'm not sure I understand all your thesis. So I want to ask two questions. I, I guess I want to ask one question to flesh out your thesis a little more and then express a concern about it. The question is something like this. What if one were to give an account of a lot of our culture where we're saying it's not two different understandings of religion, transcendent and imminent, but instead a Judeo-Christian religion and then a point of view or a mindset that just dislikes Christian bourgeois morality. And I think that, a kick, I don't think that you, I think you can answer it, but I think there is one counterexample that question gets at that you're not gonna be able to example, and that's the treatment of, of Islamic minorities in Christian cultures. Because the same kinds of people who criticize Judeo-Christian views on things are willing to accommodate Islamists who, in some ways, like if, if it's, uh, Islam, Islam is not an imminent morality or an imminent religion either. And so I'm, I'm curious of your thoughts on that. I'll voice a question now, maybe tomorrow will be the better place to address it. I am persuaded by you that there's some, an important difference between imminent and transcendent views of the divine. But I am concerned that talking about pagans is going to make people like me think that mo modern paganism is like ancient paganism or classical paganism in all respects. And I think some of what Professor George and Professor Story were getting at was uh, similar here. Like to me, the two converge on, tr on things like sexual practices and the treatment of the vulnerable, like how, whether it's every person is deserving a life at every stage of life or whether some can be killed like exposed infants were in Rome. But then things like the treatment of outsiders, the cosmopolitanism we see, the fights going on in immigration in this country, uh, the commitment to perfect economic equality, that you, I don't think you can explain using antique ideal understandings of paganism. And then things like the punitive nature of modern environmentalism, global warming, they're like, that's, it's like a synthesis of Judeo-Christian like Judeo understandings that there's a very demanding God judging combined with a, a commitment to protecting the world. Yeah, uh, well, there was a lot there. Let's see if I can, a couple of points. One is, um, in, uh, in the longer project, I have a chapter about the persistence of paganism after the supposed defeat at the end of the fourth century, let's say. And I think it persisted in a number of ways. Some of the ways are in sort of the Western memory and you know collective memory and imagination that has i think both a sort of a positive and a negative side to it the positive side is kind of like joyful memories of heinrich heine put it the merry dance of paganism you know when the world was happy and enchanted and so forth um you might think of the renaissance as you know yeah can't we recover some of that and, and so forth i mean that's these things have had their uh, their good uh, fruits, uh, I, I think, but, um, th but that's one. The negative side of it is a deep resentment uh, toward the force that supposedly crushed, you know, put out the lights on the merry dance of paganism, which was Christianity. Um, and that, I think, again, has been an ongoing theme through a great deal of certainly modern Western history, you know, over the last 500 years or whatever. Um, given that, I think it's not 
too surprising, uh, although this does seem puzzling, I think, different, different people, uh, including me at times, that, um, that you know, let's say, the kinds of people and thinking that I'm putting under the head of modern paganism would sometimes be more uh, condemning of Christianity and less so of other sorts of things that admit it, like Islam, that uh, I agree would not be an imminent religion, would be a transcendent religion, but isn't, hasn't been the subject of that long-term memory, you know, that Christianity is what is at fault for having deprived us of paganism. So, so I think that's maybe part of an explanation, part of an explanation for that, although that is a complicated phenomenon. The other thing I guess I might say, you were talking about modern environmentalism. So, so this does bring back the point, I guess, that I had to make in response to an earlier question about how I don't think that describing the sort of conflict as one between transcendent uh, religion or Christianity and modern paganism illuminates everything. I think it helps to correct some things that have been the source of considerable misunderstanding. But then if you ask, well, does it explain why the environmental movement is taking a particular form and so forth? I don't think this by itself explains that. It might help to show, say, something that you know many people have observed, it's nothing novel, that there is really a kind of religious zeal. You know, this is not just a sort of a modern, pure, positivistic, secular type of, type of phenomenon. It might help to explain that, but why it takes the particular form that it does, I, I don't think that anything I've said or I'm gonna say will offer much help with, with that, so. Mr. Rowe. Hello, Professor Smith. Um, isn't the, uh, the analog um, to uh, Christianity or transcendent religion in antiquity pagan philosophy, not paganism? So there's this well-known distinction between their worship, which imposed no kind of moral constraints, and then these kind of pagan seekers um, who were philosophizing. And if I understand, like at least one story, like if you go to the Catholic philosopher Balthazar, he considers, and I think this is a pretty common narrative, that pagan philosophy was an opening to you know, Christianity um, uh, in a way that paganism or this sort of the worship, which was not. So I'm just curious, how do you want to, it just seems, I, sometimes I think there's like a cherry picking going on when I'm talking about antiquity because part of the story of course is this worship, um, but it's really only part of the story. The other part is a story about some sort of transcendence or an opening to transcendence if all these commentators over the ages are correct. And that's pagan philosophy. So, how do you want to account for yeah, that? Yeah, right. Well, first of all, I said, uh, so I'll try and answer that. But uh, first of all, I say pagan philosophy, of course, is also uh, you know not like a single unitary you know thing. So, there's Plato would be much closer, I think, to the more transcendent and was I think viewed that way, right, by ancient Christians and so forth. Aristotle and others, perhaps less so. Certainly, there were like Stoic philosophers who were in favor of like sexual. Um, well, chastity and, and so forth, you know, so, so, so there's a lot of diversity here. But my basic story goes like this, you know, that uh, if you go back to Varro's classification, you know, there's mythological and mythical and um, civic paganism. If you take those as the basic, like, political, social type of phenomena, and you say that they were viewed as essential to, at least the civic part, even by many educated Romans, I think, thought that the civic part was necessary to preserve and uh, sanctify the city and so forth. Then philosophies in some tension with that, and Socrates, I think, found himself in a little bit of tension with, you know, pagan and polytheistic religion and so, you know, and others did. But, but one of the main roles I think that philosophy did was, try, was to try to come up with a more um, plausible philosophical grounding for pagan religion, even for people who couldn't take seriously, you know, the myths about, you know, Zeus coming down and mating with, uh, and so forth. Uh, th that's part of, what, part of what it was doing, especially I think as you get, well, I have a chapter actually in the book on Cicero's dialogue on the nature of the gods, where one of his characters, the uh, Stoic character Balbus, is doing that very explicitly, but he was sort of an early, you know, probably fairly, unrefined version of it. I think you get to, to later philosophers um, and um, they're definitely doing that, I think. Now, but I also agree that uh, once they began doing that, 
um, interpreting pagan religion philosophically and sort of suggesting, you know, that the divine nature is really one, not all these different deities and so forth, they did sort of open themselves up to arguments from Augustine and others, not just Augustine, but Augustine and others who would say, you know, well, once we're conceiving that the divinity is really unified and so forth, um, why continue to preserve the fiction of all of these little gods and so forth? So uh, I think it's clear that that kind of philosophy was an attempt, my story is, it was an attempt to defend paganism, but it was sort of defending it with a, with a medication that was slowly lethal to it. And, and so it would push it in the direction of Christianity. And Augustine, of course, would be a clear example of somebody who, who that's the path he took, right? You know, so. yeah, just to follow up, I mean, I knew it was slot through the city of God. I noticed that Augustine spent a lot of time refuting precisely Varro, and he still has detailed all of these pagan rituals. So they obviously, even up to the 5th century, have some significance, and Augustine feels like he has to deal with it. So. It seems like that to me. I mean, I have read some scholars say, oh, by the time of Augustine, paganism was pretty much, but uh, if so, he did spend a lot of time. Oh, sorry, I someone sorry. here maybe. Uh, <laughs> but, but I was going to say. If so, he, he did seem to, he, he devoted a lot, of, uh, a lot of time and effort and words to, uh, to refuting this already uh, defunct. Steve, Steve uh, uh, I'll close the questioning uh, today because we're up against our uh, time limit. But uh, since I will be away the next two days, which I very much uh, regret, I hope you will all uh, be here. Uh, I want to ask a question about the influence of modern paganism on modern and especially contemporary Judaism and Christianity. The impact of the new paganism on the established uh, monotheistic faiths. There, there may be a version of this question which would also be apt for Islam, I'm just not mm -hmm. sure. So back to uh, Plato. As you say, he uh, uh, was suspected, uh, I think with good reason, of being a kind of closet uh, monotheist. Mm -hmm. um, he's regarded, as you I think also suggested, by uh, some of the uh, early Christian thinkers as a kind of proto-Christian. Uh, mm -hmm. And in his last work, The Laws, the one that that Socrates doesn't appear in, unless Socrates is the Athenian stranger. Mm -hmm. uh, he identifies three forms of godlessness, or god absence, mm -hmm. or we might even say atheism, or secularism. Mm -hmm. uh, the first seems to correspond pretty much to what we mean by atheism today, the kind of Dawkins, Harris view. Uh, there's, there's just no transcendent reality. Mm -hmm. there's, no, there's no transcendent source of meaning and uh, value. There's no personal god. Um, the second would correspond to uh, what I think we usually use the term deism today to mm -hmm. represent. There's, there's a God, there's a, there's a transcendent reality, but not one that is much interested in the affairs of men or active mm -hmm. in the uh, human, human, human affairs. It's the, the God who winds up the clock uh, or winds, uh, you know, and disappears mm -hmm. and, and lets it go. But then the third, which he seemed most especially interested in, and this is the one that I wonder about, about in relation to the influence of modern paganism on Judaism and Christianity, is the idea that there is a God. Uh, the God is not uh, the distant, uh, absent God of uh, deism. But this God is a soft-spirited, undemanding God. The God of, I'm OK, you're OK. Uh, the God that doesn't make challenging moral demands mm -hmm. on people. The, easy, the easily appeased God, the easily bought off God, the, the God who, who forgives without repentance and mm -hmm. so forth and so on. Now, as I look at the, the struggles going on within uh, the Christian churches, especially about this issue of sexual morality, though not exclusively about that, uh, I see an awful lot of that third form of godlessness or atheism uh, in it. And I'm wondering to what extent that, or you believe that, reflects the influence of what you're calling modern paganism on Christianity and Judaism itself. Not, not in every dimension, but in certain right. denominations, and, and in, in, in the large one, in certain wings of the denominations. Um, well, OK, first one point. I, 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 again, in the longer project, I try to suggest at various points that both of these orientations toward imminent sacredness and toward transcendent sacredness have their appeal for almost all periods and maybe almost all people. And I, I think even in the lives of uh, 
let's say, committed Christians or people who would think of themselves as committed Christians. I think there's a back and forth. You know, I think there's a, you know, sometimes more, more one is more appealing than the other and so forth. So I think they, this has been an ongoing. I agree with you, though, that I don't know exactly what we trace it back to. You get into one of those things, well, it started here, but that was caused by something, but that caused by something. Usually end up with something like, uh, well, yeah, usually it ends up with like 14th century nominalism or something, you know, is where it got. But, but you know, that probably isn't. Uh, you know, the, the really end of the matter either. Um, whatever the causes, it strikes me that the influence of modern paganism, I'll continue to use that term, has been vast in modern Christianity. Um, uh, and the chapter that I have on that, I, you know, you start off the chapter by thinking, um, oh, paganism. And of course, some, some of my friends, when I even tell them about this project, you know, laugh at, you know, what a silly idea. And by the end of the chapter, it's like, is there anybody who isn't? You know, I mean, every, uh, now I think that's not true. I think there are plenty of people um, who are not pagans, who, you know, are understandingly committed to the transcendent religiosity, but just for the rank and file, and, and not only that, but for many of the, you know, more intellectual leaders and in various, within Christianity, I'd say the influences Overwhelming, and it's very hard to know for any particular person what they, you know, what they ultimately believe, and maybe even for they themselves and so forth. I mean, I've I've talked with well, one divinity school professor who says there's not a there's not a um, pastor in this country who actually believes in a literal resurrection and so forth. And told me one time, and um, he, he had taught at Chicago Divinity School and Notre Dame actually for a while, you know, and uh, and he said there's not. Um, uh, no, I don't believe that, but I admittedly, he says, but most people won't tell you, of course, and, and it makes it very hard to say, but just the outward influence of it seems to be considerable, I think. For Judaism, I'd be more reluctant to say much of anything um, uh, on that. I mean, my sense is that within Judaism, there has been uh, somewhat of a movement back to a little bit more of an orthodox you know, a set of commitments and so forth. But what that means in these terms, I'm not completely sure. Yeah, it you know, seems so. sometimes, to me, it seems that sometimes the uh, struggles manifest themselves uh, between the different denominations, whether within Christianity or within Judaism, Orthodox as opposed to Reform, you know, uh, 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 Presbyterian Church of America as opposed to Presbyterian Church USA. Uh, and, and sometimes uh, uh, within. Very and much. So within, you look at the struggle within Catholicism or the. Uh, the, the, the struggle within uh, some of the, uh, like the, the um, uh, United Methodist Church at the moment. Mm -hmm. And sometimes the struggle is between the more westernized uh, 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 elements and the global south. So, you know. Yeah. Uh, within Catholicism, and I'm not Catholic, so I, you know, but I'm closely associated by close family ties to a number of, and have worked at Catholic institutions. So I say clearly within Catholicism, this kind of tension is very obvious, I think. So please join me in thanking Professor Smith and I hope he'll see you tomorrow. Thank you. Thanks a lot.